Welcome back to the Futurist New Deal podcast. I'm Johan ben Zayen, and I'm here with uh, my special guest uh, from uh, all the way from Dublin, uh, Martin O'Day. And uh, uh, Martin is a, a longevity expert and consultant. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, some near and far future prospects in the world of super longevity. How are you doing today, Martin? Excellent. And you? Pretty good. Pretty good. I was up late doing uh, another interview uh, uh, on on your side of the pond, and uh, and then I was editing some video. So I'm not going to lie; I'm a little tired, but feeling pretty good. <laughs> good. That's fine. That's fine. My uh, brain is always tired, so we'll we'll match up <laughs> nicely. <laughs> uh, so a second ago, we were we were talking about um, uh, the uh, state of e-governance and uh, public health and initiatives towards uh, maybe uh, decentralized and big data usages there um, in, in, the, in the EU. Uh, what do you, who do you think are some winners and losers in this? I don't have enough evidence to answer you know, definitively on that. I know the, in the UK just recently there was a, a parliamentary, cross-parliamentary group uh, for mm-hmm. longevity uh, mm-hmm. launched at the end of May. Um, and I know a couple of the people involved in that, but I think that's a really good initiative. Um, mm. I think one of the ways in which they're trying to push the, the agenda to tackle the diseases of aging is mm. to look at it from the perspective of the financial cost of the pension crisis. So mm. they're highlighting, you know, a, 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 an awful lot of these companies, in fact, are uh, companies that are successful now are actually on paper, uh, you know, completely bankrupt because of the money that they owe um, under the the pension systems that are in place. So Mm. they're trying to leverage um, the potential to invest in the technologies so that they're almost going to win from their own, you know, their own downfall. So if somebody's Mm. going to win from these uh, life extension uh, technologies, then they're they're trying to bring financial uh, service sector into that arena. And I think it's a very intelligent way of doing it. I think. they're also looking, you know, just to hedge, mm. hedge money against uh, this this continuous growth in their deficit because people are living longer. And uh, you know, when when the pension started in Ireland, the independence in 1922, 65 was very few people lived to 65, mm. um, and now the average age is 80, 81, uh, and so the the I'm not sure if it's in Ireland, but the trend in Europe is is, is towards one in three people being 65 or over in the mm. next 40 years, which is just unmanageable. Mm. Completely unmanageable. It's a, big, it's a big number. It's why we need to get to full automation uh, as soon as possible. <laughs> well, that's another uh, yeah, that's another element of it. But that's that's a whole other uh, major political mm. and societal reconstruction. But yeah, uh, yeah. Like every front and I mean, and even the technical. Even the technical yeah. underpinnings of that is it's a different it's a different sort of animal than longevity. Uh, it, yeah, but it's I, a different I timeline. I don't think that they they conflict in any way. If you if you keep um, you know society as it is now, its current constructs, which may not be desirable at all. But if you if you keep it like that, then extended uh, health span mm. is still just essential. From the perspective of if you forget automation, you forget re, re, uh, restructuring the, the workplace and everything else. But as things stand, you would need people to work an extra 10, 15 years or to be productive in some sense, an extra 10, 15 years mm. to cover the cost of even our current lifespans. Uh, mm. You know, if we don't tackle the, the underlying elements of aging, even if we keep just tackling around the fringes of these diseases as we have been doing. Um, the lifespan that we have currently is just, it's unmanageable financially. Mm. So and, we need to and, extend health span. And what, what, do you, what would you say to the people, there are economists um, who, who, who say this sort of thing, just more or less in light of what we just said, there's a, gap, there's a timeline gap between longer age bands and the full automation, which would allow for uh, the support of a, a much larger geriatric population. Um, uh, what would you say to the these economists who say that it's immoral for anyone to pursue longer lifespans before we have that full automation? I'm not sure. I I, I don't understand exactly why they'd make that argument. Um, well, uh, it, it, 
that, it, it's, 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 a, it's a macro argument. Yeah, I find a lot I of the time that the arguments made against the morality of, of longevity. Uh, um, I mean, the best it's way I can describe it is if someone spoke to me 10 or 15 years ago, say, when I first became interested in this and talked about longevity, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty certain my initial reaction would be, well, I, I would have problems with that. And I don't mm. know, maybe that's because it's such that's, a shift. That is theory to, to to how we bank on things being this it's it's it throws us a little bit and we find defense mechanisms but um you know the the i think the morality is just without question if you if you look i mean we already spend huge sums of money on uh, cardiovascular disease and neurodegenerative diseases on cancers um all the longevity movement is really is re reframing how you try to tackle those diseases so you're just being preemptive about it. Um, mm. And the the youthfulness that may be associated with that is, is a byproduct. Mm. The, the idea is I we, we are trying to not get sick and not um, become frail and fragile and, you know, immobile. Um, mm. And I, I don't think anyone has a problem with that. Mm. Uh, I, I, I certainly do not. I was rather playing the devil's advocate there. And I, you know, I do see say, these... I do see this, um, this, um, um, th these two things as coevals, and 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 because um, a society that that values a life to this degree is a more uh, 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 humane uh, yeah. society in, in the way that it's the civil society is organized. Uh, so um, it's not just that um, you know that's not just like a Moore's law proclamation or something. I see I see that uh, one deriving from the other as we have yeah. longer lifespans. Uh, other good things will derive uh, from that um, uh, because uh, the lifespans rather rely on a a, a certain reorder reordering of our mindsets as well. I think so. Yeah, I think that you can you can look at simple uh, elements such as commitment to environment and things if if you have a potentially longer term reality ahead of you. But um, I think as well you lose uh, this vast trove of knowledge every time somebody uh, passes on um and it, that's almost irreplaceable stuff really uh, yeah it's and, not just a sentimental notion it's a systems theory notion yeah there's just an awful that, lot of, a lot you well, know it's, it's, that's it. i mean it's getting a little bit you know of a detour but if you look at the the uh, as you go through um your own development uh, I, you know, I, I lost you for a second. I, I had an interruption from another incoming call. I, I should have blocked it. Sorry. Um, so, um, I'm not sure exactly where we were, but I was, I was saying that if you look at, uh, as people learn, be it an economic crisis or be it a war that their, their people have gone through, um, and, and they, they reach a point, you know, in their own development where they go, okay, that was terrible. This was a mistake. I'm learning. And then a generation comes up after them. There's nothing against, you know, youthful generations, but you are often struck by the the naivety and the, the willingness to make mistakes that people have already learned from, particularly mm. from younger people. Mm. You can con continue to have younger people, but you have them as a smaller percentage of an mm. old population. Um, and you have people in their in their 70s and 80s who are mobile, who are intellectually agile. And have all that experience and all that wisdom. Um, and I think that's a huge resource to bring to the table as well. If you're keeping people healthier for longer, uh, you're gaining in, in systems, knowledge, like you say, but in common sense and wisdom and experience. Um, and I think that can only be a beneficial thing. Um, yes. Yes. And we're, and we're so, kind of, ex without, we don't, we don't, we don't take a sort of, uh, a, a real uh, reckoning of that because we have so many uh, uh, notions and rights around death, but we are kind of experiencing what uh, uh, some what is kind of a huge atavistic effect when, when a generation of people dies. You know, you can imagine, you know, you know, like a, a, a society that had learned to make fire and then forgotten to make fire. This has happened in prehistory like 400 times or something. Um, and, you know, we're kind of we're kind of doing the same thing. Uh, by um, uh, by by our fatalistic attitudes for death, and by uh, the technical shortcomings to to achieving that at, at present as well. Um, yeah.
Uh, so, what do you think? What do you think of of uh, a longevity escape velocity? Um, is it um, is it something that's going to be for everyone? Is it something that you think is um, ten years away, thirty years away? Well, I, I I mean I'm certainly not a scientist and not qualified to to answer that. But one thing I would say is when that question is asked, it's often answered in a way like this is predicting the arrival of a comet or something. Mm. It is not at all yeah. set in stone uh, when that is mm. achieved. For that to be achieved, certain things need to happen. Um, things need to be learned. Things, mistakes need to occur. Things need to be trialed. Um, research has yeah. to be done. Scientists have to come to collaborate. All of that stuff yeah. can happen at a whole range of different speeds. Um, mm. And that comes back to funding. And that comes back to um, people advocating and people pushing whatever lever they can. You know, I've been interested in this for maybe a decade or more. But um, it wasn't until it became an industry in the last five years that I felt there was anything I could contribute as someone who, mm. you know, um, has a background in, in business strategy. I felt, well, maybe I can come in and I can take a consultancy role and do something to help these startups uh, to, to get themselves to the point where they can at least test uh, their their scientific theories and see well does this work or does that work or how does this benefit a disease um, containment or prevention or treatment um, and uh, yeah I think that it's it's encouraging when you see people who really know what they're talking about uh, bring their estimates down a little bit but I think and and that's look that it really matters because people need to have. I think a sense that this isn't 200 years away and irrelevant to them. I, I do think they need some basis, but uh, it is speculation and it is, uh, it is, I think, a result of what funding goes into this. I mean, I, I find it very hard to imagine that people will age the way we currently age in 150 years' time. I find that really difficult to imagine. I find it also very difficult to imagine that there would be a pill in five years' time that would keep you youthful. Hmm. So there's, but it there's seems... a five-year window there, and I don't know where it is exactly. I would think, uh, I mean, the escape velocity, if you take someone who's 70 now, hmm. I mean, they still, even according to someone as esteemed as George Church, they still have a chance Absolutely. of having therapies that will... Um, allow them to live healthier to a period where there are other therapies and so on. Um, so you need to keep the, the, the hope up because it's not completely foundless. Mm. The, That's not answering the question, but it's, it's different. No, I, I, I think it, it is, it, it, a lot of it depends, you know, like you said, we, there are people and it's very hard to uh, deny them who say, I, you know, I'm, we are at, um, we are at, there are people alive who are at a uh, uh, longevity escape velocity. At the same time, some universal long, uh, longevity escape velocity may be something that's a thousand years away or uh, never. And also, the, you know, the universal longevity escape velocity maybe implies a, some sort of compulsory element. Um, and uh, that, that, that's, not, that's, not really, uh, that's not really desirable. Um, no, but, I don't, um, I don't that would be a question anyway. I really don't. I, I think if you if you find a cure for cancer, nobody says, um, well, I refuse to take that. And I think yeah. this will be the same thing. I think it's just a framing and a psychology issue at the moment. But um, yeah, nobody I wants think that people to... like I think that people like the Christian scientists will even move, move the goalposts. You know, oh, they absolutely. still may not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and there, there might be resistance there, but, but um, you know, religion is is is. It's fantastic until you get a viable alternative, you know. Um, <laughs> so, um, no disrespect to, to any any uh, yeah. uh, religion, but it's yeah, a, no. it's a it's a little war. It's a little war in our party. Um, I, I've done a few um, uh, really? interviews with uh, techno spiritualist minded people and um, and uh, religious syncretists, uh, people who are you know from the uh, Mormon Transhumanist Association the Christian Transhumanist Association yeah. I talked to some of these guys just in the last few weeks uh, but um, the, um, the uh, these guys have a certain presence in uh, these organizations but also there's these uh, kind of new atheist personalities 
uh, who uh, who really get a, can get under their skin. <laughs> and yeah. I've been I, I, I'll admit it in in previous in, in previous uh, uh, lifestyles I've been that person at times. Yeah. Uh, but um, uh, I you know I try uh, for one thing the um, uh, of these two these two organizations particularly and uh, re- religious transhumanists generally they're not people they're not people who are uh, factionalists. Uh, they're not people who are um, proselytizing and, you know, suggesting that some somebody who doesn't uh, 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 doesn't happen to come from their area or happen to doesn't yeah. doesn't happen to accept some jo- doctrinal point um, is is an apostate. They're, these are these are religious moderates. Um, yeah, but it uh, would be to, to be calling themselves transhumanists. I can imagine it. They yeah. would have to have. Uh, yeah. I suppose it is an yeah. important enough issue and people, it, it probably goes back to how it's framed in the first place then, whether you're talking about, you know, from the spectrum of immortality down to um, improving cardiovascular health. It, there's a big, you know, there's a big window there of what you could be saying. You could be working on something and you could claim to be doing both of those things. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, one of them will really frighten people and another one will absolutely be a positive uh, response mm-hmm. is what you get. So I guess there is a role for people who are expert in in marketing and psychology in this field. Well, that's sure. actually that's actually where I was going to push this. Um, yeah. So there's a gentleman in the United States who I personally, some people do admire him, but I personally regard him um, as a, a dangerous lunatic in a certain light. His name is Alex Jones. Probably familiar with the kind of way that he addresses transhumanism, uh, but. But this kind of approach, yeah, sorry. This, this, this is also in the news today uh, with another gentleman, uh, uh, Epstein, and um, uh, being uh, having having been described as a transhumanist at a certain point. And the reason that I bring these two gentlemen up is because um, the, I don't like you said before. There's nothing particularly sensational about about interventions to disease and people opting to continue to live longer and longer as the, um, it it's a it's above it's above attack in a certain light uh, so anything uh, that would tend to create a, a high level of interest even a moral panic because it's not gonna, I don't believe there's any situation where it would be legislated against uh, in any real degree anything that creates uh, that level of interest in life extension um, I think is is an, is a, a dramatic net positive. So I think that somebody like Alex Jones uh, is, can do uh, maybe in a sense as much for uh, making people think about life extension as Elon Musk might. And what is he doing? Uh, Alex, well, he's, he is, but well, he, he has uh, he he has a uh, paranoid conspiracy theory a media network uh, which is somewhat hobbled now. <laughs> no, I know. I know. Um, I love him, but I don't know what he's doing regarding transhumanism or, or well, life extension. Well, his his network pretty routinely uh, does talk about uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, techno optimist notions in fear mongering terms, maybe more okay. so than than um, any other large network of that kind. Um, and uh, and and his and his audience, uh, they're fanatical about um, they were fanatic more fanatical about uh, kind of engaging people and and. And spreading these talking points, which by and large are, are which which by and large are quite uh, disruptive and insane. I don't, I don't, um, I don't support um, the level of um, uh, oligarchy that that he seems to be comfortable with. I don't support the the building of troll farms on the behalf of of, uh, of oligarchs either. But <laughs> um, uh, so, well, but I, I was just I po- describing this one particular point. Yeah, I know. Um... I saw I was in in New York not that terrible long ago and uh, at the Ending Aging Related Diseases conference with mm. Keith Camito and Lifespan were holding. And I know Keith was on um, the Young Talks uh, last year, maybe the year before, um, mm. with Jink Uger. Uh, and I thought Keith did really, really well there. But mm. that, like those, it's almost like background music where. Like I say, 10 years ago, I first became interested in this. I met Aubrey de Grey in 2011 in London, and uh, it was very different, very, very different. It was uh, fringe. It was, um, you know, almost something that people would keep quiet that they that they had research. I remember talking to a lady at that conference who was explaining that she was, her interest, uh, she was a pure scientist. Her interest was in aging, 
but mm. she would never say that. She would say that she was studying Parkinson's because it was the only way that she could get any funding. Um, so the world has changed an awful, awful lot in that eight years. Um, and I think, uh, you know, a couple of major events uh, in 2013 was a, was a huge year with Google's Calico and, and so on. Um, but the, the, the little things like people going on a channel here or having a conversation about it, somebody flicks by it in a magazine or on Facebook, they see, you know, uh, scientists discover a gene that does blah, blah, blah. And it, they may not think about it in great detail at that time, but I, I, I think that if you have a conversation with someone now, or well, I know from experience, if you have a conversation with someone now on this topic, it doesn't have the shock factor that it had six, seven yeah. years ago. Which yeah, is so one, maybe a lot of that work is done. It's really, yeah. I mean, I think in, 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 in the annals of history, Aubrey de Grey will have a huge, huge amount of credit due mm. to spin at least 10 years of being, you know, put down as he, he, he was um, prophesizing this uh, and was knowingly putting himself in a position where people would try to ridicule him and everything else, but had the, the confidence and the, the certainty to continue and has come around now as being, you know, um, a figure of admiration, I think. Uh, but, you... Yeah, sorry. Do you think, do you think we have a duty uh, to uh, try to uh, emulate that of, of bringing people in whatever way we possibly can uh, to uh, life a, extension. There's a role for everybody, I think. Um, I, mm -hmm. I, sometimes I think it's it's a little bit like the the green movement in that you have you know activists, you have politicians, you have um, people, scientists doing the work. You have a, a collection of people across different walks of life, all trying to do what they can to address a global and really important problem. Um, and I think that's what needs to occur with aging as well. I think... Uh, I use that analogy. Even using the term aging is, is you know, I sometimes, uh, I, I worry about that because aging will continue. I mean, you the distance between you and your chronological date of birth will continue to you know, increase. So mm. you will age, you will get older, but the idea is to retain health and and, mm. and it's, I think the best way of describing it is it's actually to, to tackle like a, um, a parent disease to all these other diseases. That's mm. fundamentally all that's going on there is uh, your biological systems, your cells and the systems lose their robustness and this leads to a whole plethora of things that we call diseases, but also that that general condition of frailty that we recognize as age. But all of that can be sucked back to the same sort of, um, you know, problems and issues arising. And that's mm. what these people are trying to, to deal with and are having some real success uh, mm. in, in model organisms and in theories being uh, you know, tested, and uh, it's in a ridiculously complex field, obviously. Mm. But um, but the fact that they can do any of this, the fact that Cynthia Kenyon could do this in, in the 1990s, um, mm. could, you know, extend the lifespan of a worm, and what it must have been like to be in that lab and to be looking at this worm and, and mm. like, look at the watch and look at the calendar and saying, why is this thing not dead yet? Must mm. have been incredible to, mm. you know, to see a definitive lifespan being altered substantially by switching off one gene must have been incredibly exciting. Uh, and mm. I think the work is re really, really, really complicated and challenging and everything else, but it's not something that is in any way impossible. It's, it's clearly possible. Um, mm. And I mean, sometimes I, I, I think we're actually less confident than we should be. And I think a part mm. of that comes from this egocentrism of humans are so 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 complicated and so extraordinarily you can't but we are very robust as well i mean yes we degrade over time but it's not like this is this finely tuned perfect instrument that if you you know a violin or something if you tweak one little thing the whole thing falls apart mm. you can put a, a pig's heart into a human you know <laughs> we, we are quite resilient in some ways also um mm. and we have our own repair mechanisms. Um, and in mm. some ways, 
people will, will, will push the theory that it's actually the repair mechanisms that we have. It's their uh, wear and tear that leads to the other problems. Um, mm. And that may well, and that may seem like a, an even easier solution if that's the the road that brings the most uh, return. But um, we are resilient, I think. Physical systems, um, we are open to intervention. It's not like you do one thing with the human and everything else falls apart necessarily. Yes, it is an integrated, complex system, but mm. there is there is a you know room there. There is a resilience there. Um, mm. So. Like I'd be, I I listen to the people who know really what they're talking about, and I think, um, I think George Church and Harvard stands kind of shoulder above everybody in some ways, um, and some mm. of the some of the statements he makes would really encourage me in, in terms of the the time spent for this thing. Mm. And what what do you think about um, uh, for for people who who are are sensitive to these concerns and wanting to be uh, erring on the side of cough? caution as much as possible. Do you recommend, you know, the, the iWatch now has a health monitoring capacities a little bit more, a little bit fancier than what people might realize. Um, and that's, you know, that's a constant, uh, a constant monitoring of a number of these uh, measures of, of your health. Um, uh, you know, and that's a little expensive, but there's, uh, there's uh, uh, cheaper versions of that same thing. Um, uh, do you recommend something like that? Or do you recommend to um, uh, leave it to the doctors? Well, no, I think, I think what uh, I, I mean. I I understand you're putting yourself forward politically as well, yes, um, yes. which is great. But I think that there are there's information and and certainly there's the capacity to store and share information now at a level that's just ridiculous. So mm. when you have people, um, particularly older people, say if if I look around Ireland and I look at all the people that are living by themselves and maybe they have a panic button. But the panic mm. button will ring somebody, and mm. then it will ring somebody else, and then maybe an ambulance will. Like so it's not a robust will, intervention. Yeah. No, your body will have a good idea that you're going to have a heart attack 24, 48 hours before you know anything about it. Mm. Um, and the technology already exists to monitor um, mm. people's health. Uh, I mean, you could do this for everybody, I think. It, it wouldn't be that extraordinarily expensive. but. Certainly for all the people and vulnerable people, I, it, it baffles me. I can remember meeting somebody, it must be at least seven years ago, in the National Digital Research Centre in Dublin and having a conversation with them about their sensor technologies. They were from University College Dublin. And uh, I, was, I was just discussing what they were doing and could it be used for this particular application? They were saying, of course. And, and they were saying it in such a way as in, well, that would be quite simple to do. So this is, you know, using sensor technologies to gather um, health data on individuals, have that transferred to that person's GP and also to the mm -hmm. hospital, um, mm -hmm. and, and have it have it follow them around if needs be, um, and this would uh, this would lead to huge savings. Yes, um, on, on services. And I can recall saying it to that gentleman and saying, "Well, why don't you go to the health service uh, in Ireland?" and he said something like that he had tried doing that and that they talk about it wasn't in the budget or it wasn't there, you know, that's not really their choice. Or So he wasn't getting that embrace of technology mm. from health service. Technology to them is seen as something to the side of what they do rather than being deeply integrated into it. And mm. I, I think that's a problem. I think politics really could embrace uh the information side of healthcare, I think it would be mm. a very positive step because this can be used as well. If you're running clinical trials or if you're trying to monitor, um, you know, the impacts of certain things, uh, be it the dietary or supplements or whatever, or, or actual medicines, you now have a constant stream of data about mm. somebody's well-being, um, mm. and that's useful as research goes forward. So. To me, it's it's absolutely. I, I don't understand why this doesn't happen. Um, mm. Yeah, aside from privacy issues or something, it, this. I mean, this the, the health it's, service is public, so. Yeah, it's. I think it's it's partly to do with uh, maybe a little. This came up in the Estonia discussion. Estonia might be is is well poised uh, to uh, start to be using uh, data, uh, uh, big data, as it relates to biomedicine in uh, these kind of uh, public private consortiums because they already have. 
uh, so many other, uh, uh, they already have so many other boxes ticked that would make it easier uh, to be able yeah. to uh, kind of interweave those. Um, and, um, and, and it is absolutely true. I mean, in the United States, uh, this, this, this level of intervention uh, on whatever timeline it would be implementable would be saving trillions of dollars. Um, they, I mean, basically, this principle of an ounce, an ounce of prevention being worth a pound of cure and, uh, yeah. and, and this constant monitoring and, and systematizing of all, this, of, of all of this information. Absolutely. I don't understand. I mean, and uh, the, the, I, I can recall watching a, a, a lady give a talk on her geriatric care um, that she was running in uh, Australia and in um, Holland. And it was all excellent stuff. And it was very interesting talking about people's gait and how they walk and how quickly they stand up. Mm. And how these were such strong predictors of mortality. Actually, it's, it would put you, it would have you thinking for a day about how quick you stand up because <laughs> how quickly yeah. you get off yeah. the table is a really, really strong predictor of your life span. Now yeah. I'm scared. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty fit, but people have always sometimes commented that I'm always like grabbing my back, like in the yeah, old yeah, yeah. <laughs> I gotta, I, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta, go, I gotta get to the doctor. <laughs> for older person, yeah, it's it's a real strong indicator. But so she was talking about this. Um, so when I'm using my mobile phone here, you know, and we twist it over, we rotate it like this, and there is a, a sensor that picks up on that motion and decides that the phone needs to rotate the picture. But um, on the camera, they are using that same technology to monitor patients uh, in terms of their balance and their gait. And it's Siemens are doing this uh, with this lady, Andrea Meyer. And um, it seems to me like that's a really excellent partnership and that's sort of the type of thing that should that these tech companies should be doing um into the future they're not losing money on this i mean it, obviously these things will be paid for by the health service or whomever they will also sell data on the other end perhaps but um but it's providing a real good public service as well it's mm. just it, like so they get a sample of people that come in and they didn't monitor uh, i'm sure they can do what the watch does their their heart rate and all of this but um, they're also getting their how far they walk, how fast they walk, mm. what their balance is like, what their gait is like, um, and things like standing up and sitting down. And it's mm. it, you build, uh, you know, as with any information tech like that, you just keep building on top of of the data you have, and and you suddenly have the possibility to intervene early enough. And, and preempt problems for individuals. And, you know, maybe there's a day when the ambulance will come to your door, mm. you know, <laughs> rather than you calling the ambulance. Um, mm -hmm. I think that that's, that's uh, not so far off uh, uh, for us either. And uh, certainly the, um, uh, the advanced algorithms um, in monitoring and, and doctoring basically um, fill in a lot of those gaps, yeah. I imagine, quite quickly. Based on based on the kinds of uh, of, of of literature that I'm seeing, uh, that uh, prototypes that exist, um, it's again it's the kind of thing that you're saying. Um, uh, people maybe don't have the will to uh, be putting these things out there because uh, there's not a, there's not a, a political clamoring or consensus for it. Um, yeah, there's, I and, mean, there's liability and there's privacy issues and stuff like that. But but I think you can do some of this. Some of this work can be done, you know, in an indicative sense rather than creating liability for anybody and say, look, I mean, w when you take your, your uh, when you wear your watch, if it has a heart rate monitor on it, you don't sue somebody if you have a heart attack, you mm -hmm. know? Y you understand that this is a feature. Um, mm -hmm. So there's, again, there's a spectrum between that and the doctor prescribing you something and it being the wrong thing and you, you uh, succumbing to an illness. So I think, you know, mm -hmm. with a bit of effort, uh, and kind of collaboration, these these things, the information but, tech foray into health should really be a lot stronger. That uh, that uh, that liability issue has been an argument for why um, uh, self driving cars are not being adopted uh, more quickly. That uh, that uh, there's no intermediary who is then liable, so the corporation that produced it uh, has more exposure. Um, that's it's the kind of it's the same kind of thing that we're saying. And yeah. what we really need to do is have people making some command decisions here and saying, you know, these self-driving cars we have in the United States, we have 33,000 people dying every year uh, from this. If there were more self-driving, even a small drop in that would be sort of a disease vector effect where it would be dropping, the deaths would be dropping more dramatically than 
uh, than the number of implementations. Um, yeah. So um, the uh, it, it's a it's a precise same argument with uh, this um, uh, this uh, data driven uh, uh, biomedicine yeah. and, and 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 these interventions. And uh, um, we just kind of have to be uh, 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 knocking people over the head, but it's it's not sexy uh, to people talking about statistics and so forth. <laughs> How do we make it more interesting? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, and I mean that's the whole progress progressive versus conservative type of uh, issue anyway I can understand I think caution is a better word than conservative for some people you know progress is going to happen anyway progress has always happened but um, to me there's two types of conservative then there's the conservative who who is in a position where did they want to keep things as they are because they're better off um, and that's understandable existential it's, risk it's, concerns yeah it's understandable it's not nice but it's understandable but I think a lot of people then are just cautious and change and, and any tech things start to frighten them a little bit. And I think that caution isn't useless. I think it is it has uses. Um mm. and you know it makes regulators that bit more stringent and it makes but ultimately progress will come and improvement comes. Um and and uh, I'm sure the media cycle is awful where you are now, but Generally, things have gotten an awful lot better over the last hundred years in almost every mm. measure, you know. So, mm. and and that's that's progress. That's technology. That's um, mm. the reason I have a better standard of living than somebody a hundred years ago who had a, a you know much better job than I had and, and a higher relative salary than I have is technology. It's nothing else. It, I mean, I've got better mm. transport. I've got better entertainment. I've got better life expectancy, I've got better health, I've got better nutrition. In almost every measure, except maybe social esteem, I have a better standard of living. Um, but yet I have less money. So money, the wealth isn't really the thing there, it's the technology that has mm. led to that advance. So mm. progress will happen, and I understand conservatism, but yeah, sometimes it's frustrating when people have it for, you know, for all the wrong reasons. Well, I, I think of uh, I do think of some of these things as um, maybe proxy wars about existential risk. I'll 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 take everybody's favorite subject, abortion. If you look at the U.S. Uh, uh, debates on abortion, it kind of doesn't make sense. It just sounds like a mm. lot of emotional noise. Uh, but if you and if you take a step in kind of that sort of Alex Jones argument, uh, if you take a step back from it, uh, you might see it as uh, people drawing a line in the sand about advanced uh, fertility medicine or biomedicine that uh, that doesn't mm. di maybe directly uh, pretend existential risk, but it pretends uh, a, a such a disillusion of the uh, social conservative uh, kind of uh, notions uh, that, uh, you know, you know, you think of um, Aldous Huxley, um, that, that like that's the, those people are maybe uh, they maybe maybe read Aldous Huxley and maybe they're not so sure they want to live Aldous Huxley. Uh, but but so they're erring on the side of the caution in in may, in having uh, this um, big line yeah. in the sand ahead of these other uh, fertility medicine things, which um, I mean, you know, I've been a, a life extensionist really as long as I can remember. I've been an enthusiast about this concept as as, it, as I became aware of it. Um, and um, uh, but um, uh, there are things in advanced algorithms. And there are things, you know, in um, CRISPR related things, they, they scare they scare me. There are things in the metaverse concepts that scare me. Um, so I can understand uh, uh, people erring on the side of caution to some degree as we're moving into yeah. this uh, hastening of techno progress. But I mean, look, it's, it's an obvious argument, but fire, you know, every technology has the potential to be misused or to cause accidental harm. Um, but since humanity began so it's more to do with how humans relate to each other than the technology in question and how they build systems of trust and um you know an intelligent analysis then and uh, an improvement is is even more important um mm. and uh, you know getting away from lazy thinking and sort of uh endless debates about very little uh it, it can be very frustrating um but the, I, I, yeah, absolutely. I understand. The, you know, whether it's designer babies or, or GMOs or, or what, 
these things ring fear. Um, and, and like GMO is a good example of that. Uh, organisms are always modified, they're always, you know, between mutated or, or whether we're interbreeding dogs or horses or whatever it is. We've been doing this forever. And um, you don't want companies to have huge power and to cause harm, but that's, I mean, you, you would do that in any circumstance. You, you would try to have regulatory oversight over the fact that the company isn't poisoning you or killing you. That would be a good idea, regardless of whether you're genetically engineering an organism or not. But if you look at, at a billion people being fed because you can engineer corn or rice in a different way, then that is a wonderful advance. Mm, you know, it's, yes. a very, it's a very lazy yes. argument. Just say, oh no, no, I'm against that. I, I, I don't think it's it's natural, or I don't think it's. Um, I mean, of course, bad things can happen with any of this stuff, but uh, I suppose you, you have to. Like I often find with people with um, AI and with technology in general, and their distrust and their worry in self-driving cars, and and um, you know, oh, I could never do that. That would terrify me. Mm. And and I often say to them, well, what about a traffic light? Mm. You know. Yeah. You trust I, you trust when you go through a green traffic light that the other one isn't also green. Mm, and yeah. to be perfectly honest with you, I think that would be an easier thing to hack than some of these other technologies. Um, yeah. and, I mean, my concerns don't really stem from uh, uh, engineering problems; they stem from human error. Um, and and so I, you know, I'm I I may be more comfortable with an idea of a surveillance state. Uh, than people I know, um, even, yeah. even in techno optimist community, uh, for for this precise reason, and it's why the futurist New Deal, uh, my my platform, is is focused uh, solely on near term implementations for advancing more post industrial society and full automation, and advancing um, uh, uh, super longevity. And there's you know there's uh, people can disagree on the best ways to do this. You know, just in the way that somebody might say Alex Jones. Uh, interesting guy who had something or somebody who say he should he should have never been born or something <laughs> um you're, you're but um, him a lot of a lot of media coverage <laughs> um, <laughs> feeling sorry for him being deep deep platforms i think is it <laughs> uh but but you know it, the this this the instability i i do believe that um any sort of instability is is um results from economic instability and um and uh, so you know we 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 won't we won't need maybe that that as robust of a surveillance state or you know a a, a, a surveillance uh, a surveillance framework or a sur surveillance state either of those if um, if we do uh, sort of sort of have that rising of all boats as would occur in a, in a rapid uh, a, a post industrialization a rapid uh, um, um, post post scarcity uh, kind of situation yeah. which is which is not which is not the subject of our discussion here but it is i think it it, it relates pretty close it's a funny a funny thing though as you say uh sometimes when the occasional time that i put because my my key role is to help companies to get funding and to to build these uh interventions medical interventions so that's my primary role but you absolutely when, when you go to conferences people ask you questions and, and uh you know it, Sometimes you say that the thing you're passionate about is uh, addressing the diseases of aging. And the immediate response to that is, well, what are you going to do about, <laughs> you know, and it's like you've taken on a role where you have to solve all your other problems of the world. Hmm. Um, but I do think that there, there is, uh, you can say, look, that's not my concern. And you wouldn't ask someone who's working in cancer to solve the other problems of the world. But I think also that maybe there is some argument, arguments that need to be made around things like I don't want to work forever and mm -hmm. the the likely alignment of, as you said, you know, automation uh, and intelligent automation and more intelligent automation um, mm -hmm. leading to a different environment, uh, a different um, workplace scenario in 50 years time or 30 years time or whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. And so maybe, maybe there is a need to bring those things together hmm. it's Which a popular it's, it's a popular meme meme amongst uh, transhumanist is uh, a, a, a fully automated luxury communism memes a kind of uh, uh, describing uh, this kind of thing and, um, um, and most of these people would not uh, be be of course describing themselves as 
uh, communists in any 20th, 20th century uh, meaning, uh, but uh, uh, still um, embracing uh, full automation, post-scarcity notions, and uh, 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 embracing a sort of reordering of society towards a oligocracy or a more fully uh, realized uh, technocracy. Um, yeah. And uh, that's, I, th I think those ideas are exciting. I think that those are the things that we uh, should be uh, working towards. And again, like nobody has all of the answers, uh, but yeah. we've really uh, spent a lot of time with the Futurist New Deal uh, trying to um, uh, describe bridges uh, to that in, in near-term policy considerations in the U.S. And yeah. um, um, I hope I hope that some people are 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 maybe more enthused about um, about full automation generally or life extension uh, as well, even if they don't agree with um, um, a stopgap such as a, a basic income. That's our but we have a basic income that's funded from uh, the leasing of of federal lands, uh, eighty five percent of which are are not national parks, and uh, they're um, they're held in such large number. Uh, that even by leasing them to um, um, uh, carbon neutral companies that uh, 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 adhere to certain design stipulations, they would it would still be a number uh, on the order of 173 trillion dollars over 10 years, uh, which is enough to um, which is enough to fund a basic income for every adult in the United States at a middle class level, 52 thousand okay. um, dollars. Now, people people I know people who are full automation uh, uh, inclined. Uh, who don't think that that stopgap is a good idea, and my feeling is that they're kind of um, uh, they have a little bit of hate in their heart. <laughs> mm. uh, but um, 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 I, 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 they say that uh, it's, they say it's not realistic. The best the best way to, to just dismiss something is you you describe how how it's realistic, and someone says, "Oh, it's just not realistic," and that's the end of the conversation. <laughs> yeah, it's an easy put on. Yeah, I mean it's it is veering veering off the longevity sphere, but I. One of the things that, you know, I would have pondered is um, there is, I, I guess, the, the rapid advance in technology and where you can even comfortably project that will lead in years to come. Um, there are just benefits from collaboration and from sharing that are mm -hmm. almost sort of getting a step beyond the traditional market capitalist system. Um, network of network effects. Yeah, yeah, and and it's it's interesting to see uh, the Chinese model and how that will progress uh, during mm. this period, um, because they can certainly make use of vast amounts of of shared effort, um, mm. and in some of the projects that 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 are occurring there are incredibly impressive, and I think it's it's somewhat to do with that, but. In a sort of a and transition that, way, I often imagine that you it would be great to have um, an organization, not a company or not government, but an organization of people that um, can be, let's say, democratic workplace, you know, managers are elected, etc. also has ownership from the employees, is uh, set up in this hierarchical structure where it can allow for some failures and, and still the system is maintained. Um, and it has cafes, it has accounting firms, it has painting, uh, whatever different range of businesses that learn from each other. Because again, you have that share, that capacity to share um, because this is an open system. And mm. something like that, that is obviously CSR, um, you know, at the very, very top level, has all of these other um, modern uh, equality-based attributes, but is not for profit. Is um, directs all of the profits that it makes towards healthcare, for example. I think that you know, a body organism is very hard to. It's very hard. To, it's easy to say that it's very hard to actually go and grow it. But some young, enthusiastic people out there that say, look, we're setting up a coffee shop over here, and this coffee shop is going to be run by the people who work there. Uh, it's going to be a democratic uh, workplace. We'll elect people into positions, and we can get them out of those positions. Um, and it is going to also help this other company over here, and this company is going to... And what you have then is a, a not strictly private, not public, um, but a third option 
a third way of competing. And I think that that sort of, uh, that's very small with one coffee shop, but I think that could actually grow into the transition that, that you're talking about. Because when you, when you get more and more automated, more and more intelligent, uh, and there's more and more information shared, then private companies would really struggle to compete with this hmm. across a whole range. Like I find one of the things about technological events, let's say you want to go and run a marathon. The amount of free advice that's out there is ridiculous uh, and, and videos and guides and how to do this and how to do that. So if you have an organization that uses that vast array of opinion, um, I mean, maybe with a little bit more filtering and a little bit more uh, intelligent application than marathon running, but you have that for every problem that these organizations may face. You know, what's the best accountant to get? What do you do when this situation arises? How do you you have the potential to share resources, you have the potential to have five or six of these entities sharing the same delivery person or the same electrician or whatever the case is. And you do that in local, national, regional uh, levels. Um, and the outshot or the upshot of it is all this money goes into um, the provision of healthcare. Mm. Uh, and I think something like that, which will meet massive resistance. I mean, I noticed, you know, uh, the gentleman what? in America mm -hmm. a number of years ago, I don't know, Aaron, yeah, actually, I'm not sure, the son of the internet or something, I think he was called. But essentially, he wanted to make research in Harvard freely available, and he was hounded by the FBI, and he committed suicide. It's a really tragic story. But it just mm -hmm. goes, and I mean, it, was, it wasn't cracking the code or anything. It was a fairly simplistic and idealistic and nice concept that this person was pursuing. So it's amazing how much resistance there would be to anything like that. But mm. um, I think if you decentralize it and you, you make it like a system thing rather than some one individual or one political party or whatever, um, mm. that that's a way to transition towards a more intelligent, automated society is to have that mm. a real uh, well, way. It's it's interesting, you know. There's there's uh, legislators on, on the left in the United States who have uh, uh, talked about legislating uh, for uh, more cooperative forms in business, so that um, all workers are, are the shareholders and that sort of thing. Do you think uh, do you think that would hasten that, or do you think we need to let I that happen organically? I think that's fantastic. But I, on my understanding, is in Europe because I did have this conversation a couple of times. My understanding is in Europe, you you cannot do that as a government because it would be seen as hindering private com companies, being a hindrance that's to a, private companies. That's a sentiment in the United States, probably to a, a greater degree <laughs> than in some European yeah. countries. Or most but I, get, I, I mean, I understand if, if the government intervenes, then that is attacking the market and the market's ability to be competitive. Mm -hmm. And I, I completely see the, the argument that the market, uh, you know, has its, its, its built-in motivations for people to innovate, for people to lower prices, improve services. Of course, it rarely works like that. It's often about exploitation and everything else. But the theory is there. But hmm. in fact, with something like that, with cooperatives that are more intelligent, you would be doing that very thing. You'd be improving competition. So hmm. I think it's a ridiculous argument. Uh, look, if mm. the government intervenes, yeah. if, if I open a coffee shop and the government opens a coffee shop beside me, then I can get that. I get that that's a problem. Yeah. But if I open a coffee shop and this this organization, this this thing entity we're talking about, they open a coffee shop beside me, that's just competition. Mm. And just because yeah. they're supported in their founding and their origins by a different body, I don't think that should be a problem. But I have a funny feeling that would be a non-starter here. That if, yeah. if government my, money was involved in it, you couldn't do it. Yeah. My feeling is that uh, these m many of these people are looking for elegant rationalizations for why they should uh, not not have to pay quite quite as much taxes or uh, have resources uh, diverted in in whatever way that might occur. However, uh, there are people, and I um, I don't always dismiss them out of hand, who make arguments uh, more from a monopolist or syndicate uh, sort of view uh, that um, these larger organizations have, do have abilities that uh, a, a small group small groups of people um enfranchised in, in this way uh, that you know they might not be have doing the same kinds of things that darpa did uh in in really uh catapulting a lot of stuff uh just yeah. by virtue of being this this you know what is what is basically fascist entity in 
sense. I mean, you know, the United States was just stealing money from citizens and dumping it into into military endeavors. And and uh, a lot of that was pure insanity. But at the same time, it also invented um, or hastened the invention of uh, all of the things that are allowing us to have this conversation right now. Uh, <laughs> um uh, but uh, I, my feeling, you know, there's a guy Ben Gertzel uh, who who says who says this more more eloquently than I do, uh, that um, the, that that syndicate is the the bigger syndicate, much much bigger, is the new sphere, all of humanity. And insofar as we're um, able to uh, uh, see that growth, we will see that uh, uh, exponential growth in productivity as a result of making that shift from uh, these. Uh, these monoliths to uh, uh, to something more distributed. I, I, it's, it's, I think it's it passes the laugh test. <laughs> you you are, they are, look there are massive challenges obviously, um, and it's it's just as you know I know your background and I know the topic is long every. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry. But you do get you do, honestly you do meet these um, refrains. So you you get uh, what about resources? What about overpopulation? What about the next generation? What about boredom? What about dictators? I mean, some of these are, are ridiculous. Well, I think they're all ridiculous, to be perfectly honest with you. But I, that is the, they are the issues that people will raise. And it's mm. difficult. You, you can't dismiss somebody's concerns, obviously. So they, they do need to be looked at. Um, and overpopulation is one that I think even I can answer that because I've heard so many good answers in the past to it. Um, mm. Um, and it ties in with the resources question as well. So when you talk about extending lifespan, uh, and, and ideally for a, quite a large period of time, um, people will say, well, won't there be too many people on the earth? And how aren't we already burning up with, with global warming and everything? Um, and I think the best way that people have sort of outlined that I've picked up bits and pieces in different places is that realistically, the, the 7 billion that we have now, 7 plus, that is without any change to lifespan we'll get to about 11 and then we'll start to come down again there's a wonderful uh gentleman that passed away recently uh hans rolling i think not sure if i'm pronouncing his name correctly but he does this lovely sort of um diagram thing where he's explaining the global population and how it's it's because the the people that are in their 80s now when they were born the world's population was much smaller so as they are dying off, the population will naturally increase, even if the birth rate has gone down. Um, mm. And he explains it very nicely. Mm. I just got a, a... Am I still there? Yeah, I still got you. Apologies. But yeah. anyway, he, so he, he's uh, he's explaining this this notion that the population will get to about 11 billion as things stand, and then will start to decline because we are having much fewer children. And that's as economic growth that's happening everywhere. Um, and so if you take that 11 billion in the year 2100, if we don't find a different way to power ourselves, we're in trouble anyway. Uh, the Keeping it at 11 billion and not letting it grow to 20 billion is not going to be the solution to global warming. It just mm. isn't. You, we already have too many people if we continue to live as we live. Mm. And then you move to the space. So if you do use renewable resources and the sun provides, you know, 100,000 times more energy than we need uh, if we get better at capturing it. And um, if you didn't get beyond that and you discuss um, just space, I, I've seen some lovely talks on that uh, because sure, seven and a half billion, 11 billion sounds like a massive number. But um I think that someone described it once that if you give everybody a New York apartment uh, or a standard New York apartment, I guess, you would put the world's population in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in Texas. And the other, yeah, yeah the, well, that's the, if yeah. you give them a two bed. Yeah, yeah if you give them a house. Yeah, garden, <laughs> you put them all in Texas. Um, mm. and, uh, and even better than that is if you take Holland, which is... Uh, you know, Holland is, is, is a very nice country and infrastructure and everything's perfect. But if you had the population density of Holland in all of the land in the world, you would have 100 billion people. Hmm. Now, if you stopped everybody dying tomorrow, which, of course, is a ridiculous concept, but if you just stopped everybody from dying, you would only be adding a billion people every 10 years. 
So to add 10 billion would take 100 years. So when you look at the technological advances and you look at things like seasteading and cities being built up and all of those other issues, in fact, overpopulation is a complete red herring. And mm. I mean, it is, to, to be honest with you, the worst case scenario, when, when someone says, what about overpopulation? The worst case scenario, you'd say, well, people would die. But that's mm. precisely what's happening at the moment. People are dying yeah. from aging. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. even if you allow the arguments to go to the extreme, um, it's still not a valid case against it. But in fact, overpopulation is a complete red herring. And I yeah. think most I, of the other ones fall into that category too. I mean, there's, no, there's, not, a, um, there's not a developed society that has, um, there's not a developed na a nation that has birth rates uh, at an alarmingly high level. Uh, so, so um, we, no, we just have off. to get everybody to the, be a developed society and, and uh, we will have... But that is happening. Thankfully, that really is happening. If you look yeah. at, at the continents that were historically disadvantaged, uh, they are now going through periods, large sections of them are going through periods of economic growth. And just as sure as night follows day, economic growth and birth rates decline. Um, yeah. And people, people, people point to these uh, failings in, in, in the world today, you know, that there's still a billion people uh, living outside of that. But it's true. Yeah. Prior to the networked era, that number was uh, three times as much. And um, uh, so um, we're, we're seeing uh, uh, good effects, um, despite despite the U.S. imperialism. <laughs> uh, but the arc of history is, is moving in the right direction. I, I do. believe. Yeah, I, I think. In, in, in whatever way it's judged, the main thing is people do not need to be afraid of dedicating their lives towards eradicating diseases of aging because it has, mm, some, is... it has some moral price or some cost to it. it like, I, I would say that um, quite recently I spent some time in a hospital with somebody and that, that person is of an older age, but the people around them were all elderly people. and. Uh, it's really not nice. It's 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 not dignified. It's not pleasant. It's in fact, it's the opposite of all of those things. Um, this business of getting very old and very sick. Um, and I can remember saying to somebody, you know, these people, let's say, were in their eighties and nineties. If they were in their forties and fifties, so that's I mean, that's just a, a temporal anomaly. You know, if they were in their forties and fifties, we would consider this the greatest problem humanity has. We would say. Oh my God, what disease do these people have? That they're incontinent, that they don't know where they are, that they, they're weak, their immune systems are on the floor, they keep picking up infections because they're in a hospital, which is, you know, you go to a hospital to get better, you get sicker. Um, mm. What horrible, horrible disease do these people have? Um, mm. Because they're 40 years older, and because, in fairness, thus far, we haven't had really much hope of intervening. We have kind of made our peace with it, but mm. um, I think it, there's no doubt. But that peace is now costing us, uh, mm. because now is a not a time to make peace with it. It's a time to understand that it's not just. You can look at this as deep as you want. If, if people listen and they think I'm talking rubbish or you're talking rubbish, they can form their own opinions by reading and doing research and looking at scientific papers. And mm. the, the reality is this: there are interventions already. Mm -hmm. that will um, improve your health as you age, you know, and mm -hmm. they'll certainly with, with the era of senolytics and everything, there will be interventions that look almost inevitable in coming years that will improve health span by somewhere in the region of 5%. Mm -hmm. which is, and uh, George, George Churches, uh, George Churches uh, posted an article that uh, described a number of, of gene therapies towards aging and also uh, enhancing of human features that was, uh, you know, it was a little more articulated than uh, some of these previous things, as he often is sort of at the back. Well, George right Church, <laughs> George Church is, um, yeah, he's, he's, he's astounding, uh, yeah, yeah. an astounding, yeah. an astounding individual. But yeah, uh, of he tells, what's wonderful is he tells you things that from anybody else would seem difficult to, to believe. But mm. when, when George Church is saying these things, you, you feel like, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to question what he's saying. I, um, and uh, when you have someone in that position of knowledge and expertise across a whole range of fields that really, really matter to this stuff, 
speaking that, um, you know, authoritatively on this, uh, that's wonderful. That's great. And it's, it's something that this community should really, really highlight. Um, mm. Him and, and Judith Campisi and these other eminent uh, scientists, you know, Nobel Prize winning caliber scientists uh, mm. who have all the, they have all the gravitas, they have all the, the you know, and they have the caution as well when, when required. It's not like they're being silly and naive and childish about this. Um, mm. But they will tell you, if you don't believe us, they'll tell you that this is something that, uh, I mean, George may say it's coming quicker than Judith, but it, they they will all agree that these are interventions that can be done. Um, and mm. I, I, yeah, like you said, what George Church is doing with, with uh, CRISPR-like technologies now is... Mm. Yeah, it's pretty fantastic. phenomenal. Yeah, let's, that's let's go back. Let's go back to the governance uh, side of it, uh, particular to this uh, discussion, though. Um, so there's... Uh, we we touched upon data driven and post industrial health services how they could become uh, uh, be, be being costing pennies on the dollar uh, based on those current, current prices and you know um, uh, so uh, uh, in addition to um, being presidential candidate for the transhumanist party I'm also the uh, chair of the Arizona transhumanist party and some of the people in our party have been working on an initiative uh, here for a specific kind of um, uh, uh, healthcare. Uh, uh, a related service uh, in the United States, we don't have, unfortunately, um, a public health service that spans the entire country. It's um, it's a, a known failing of the U.S. civil society. Yeah. Um, um, and um, uh, but uh, one one concession that's made uh, to some people uh, is, is that historically, people of faith um, who uh, who were receiving some public health funds were able to set them aside in in uh, into um, in, in some different ways. Um, and one of these kinds of programs called uh, a health services account. And um, um, we are working on a health services account type program uh, for, um, for techno optimists. And we're wanting to also develop a legal fund uh, to that end. Uh, now, the reason I mention that is because I do believe if we look at countries, you know, as diverse as Cuba, Sri Lanka, Estonia, um, uh, Singapore, these may be all countries where a legal fund of the size of the Alcor legal fund, $8 million or something, could potentially uh, catalyze precisely what we were talking about in the, in the middle first half of this uh, discussion, a, data a truly data-driven and automated medical service. Um, and it's partly that it's, it's that people don't have the, maybe the political will. It's maybe also that um, developers are not strategizing to that end. And uh, so, are you are you saying that your fund would would have the ability to di dictate where it's where it's spent, where the money is? Outlet? Well, I think that going to Sri Lanka, which has a public health service, despite being a low country, um, yeah. some some small and it being a relatively small country, and also um, uh, uncontroversial, um, you know, in some of the ways that Estonia is kind of uncontroversial. Um, they might be a place where a, a, a relatively small an endowment from somebody, the kind of money that people just give to Harvard just for fun, uh, you know, an endowment uh, could uh, could be the the sort of thing that would uh, then uh, allow yeah. to uh, allow you to implement a, a, a legal fund. And once you have it in a country, what, you know, that's that's a that's a reality show. This small country uh, that's that's a poor country has achieved a life extension for pennies on the dollar. Now everybody has to do that uh, because you know, what are you going to be? Yeah, I'll tell you off off air. I'll I'll mention someone to you that I know has has done a bit of global trotting to to try and identify places um, mm. that would be suitable for something like that. Um, but they, yeah, of course, there's, is, there's is he or she camera shy? <laughs> no, we'll no, but I, I I don't want to be naming the person in case yeah, they yeah, don't yeah. want to name them. Yeah. But um, a it's yeah it's it's obviously very very interesting what uh, the, and there is the regulatory side as well of course on on any mm -hmm. of this that's being looked at and um you know the 15 years from from concept to to therapy uh in the drug development world um i think that the international differences there are maybe maybe something to be exploited. They're not that much, to be honest with you, but but certainly 
what you can buy, obviously, there's a huge difference from region to region, and it would make sense to to use that. And I think as well, I think personally, it's almost incontrovertible that the biggest industry in the world in in the coming decades will be um, longevity related. Whatever term is put on it, it will be mm. these diseases of aging and the companies. I don't think that's even up for argument. I mean, we spend a quarter of a trillion dollars on anti-aging creams, mm. a quarter of a trillion dollars every year, which demonstrably mm. don't work. Yeah. So something that does work would just be an absurd market. Um, mm. And I think as the conversation has moved from 2008 to 2013 to 2019, whatever, um, countries are becoming aware of this gradually. And there will be some, like you say, like the Estonia with the, you know, using e-capacity e for almost everything um, a decade ago. There will be countries who will be positioning as well now that they, they want to get in there. We want to be the ones where the best startups, the best researchers, the best companies want to base themselves for mm. research and aging. Um, and that's exciting as well when that competition starts. Uh, mm. and one thing I was going to mention to you, I didn't say this before, so it's like I'm, I'm, I'm sort of sneaking in a, a false advert here, but, um, well, not a false advert, but, a, you know, an unagreed one. Um, so I've been to a number of conferences, and in, in the last one in New York, I kind of scoped out with a number of people. So I'm going to have a, a, an aging conference in Dublin next year. Mm. Um, you're very much invited and anybody else that, that is watching this. Um, so it's a, this is very early stages of planning. We, mm. It's on decision taken in the last couple of weeks. Um, but we'd be aiming for maybe the end of April 2020. But uh, but yeah, I mean, the, the, one of the, the reasons for that is to give Ireland a shot at being a place where, where a lot of this activity takes place. Um, because mm. it isn't currently, but it has a lot of the infrastructure, a lot of the ecosystem that's required. It has a mm. really good medical device sector and uh, um, a lot of other, you know, core elements that would be required for this uh, around the legal side and around the financial side. All of that is very well covered. So that's the the hope is to bring people along, you know, make some sort of a, a social event out of it as well. And um but also try to build an industry. So I think that that let's, international. Let's have, a, let's have another talk on uh, on 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 camera uh, leading up to that, and let's plan on yeah. having someone from the Transhumanist Party uh, organization there as well. That would be excellent. Oh, it'd be um, brilliant! Yeah, look, I, I'm going to spend the next eight or nine months building partnerships and, and trying to get different uh, as many different groups. Uh, I, I mean, it, they, I'm 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 sort of surprised. I I've lived in in Dublin most of my life most of my adult life um but because i've been teaching and stuff I, i've stepped out of the business world a little bit in terms mm -hmm. of and i'm surprised at how <laughs> i mean without insulting dublin of 25 years ago but it has become extremely professional and and very well run and everything seems to be done right and and so the the hope and i don't want to jinx it now but the hope would be that the the event itself would be you know well run and and People could do some um, touristy stuff around it as well, and, and we might even have some add-ons like that. So maybe when people are booking tickets, there'll be an option to also add in this trip or that trip, or if they were going to make a couple of days extra out of it. So um, it seems like the capacity is there to do all of this. That they're they're um, they have an awful lot of the infrastructure in place, but they don't have a longevity industry at all. Mm. Um, and I'm hoping to change that, but I think as well that's something for all any other country or any other region within a country to consider. Because I, mm. I, I think it's inarguable that this is where money will go um, mm. and, and where people, because I mean, how much would you spend to retain your health? Mm. Yeah, and, and that's, it's the question, you know, that you brought up in, in talking about these markets, that there's these um, kind of uh, uh, pseudoscientific markets of various kinds. And, you know, I, honestly, I would, you you can't nationalize those things. There's no way to like reallocate all of those resources in a in a way that would be realistic. Uh, but I, I I regard the funerary business. You know, the funerary business would be like uh, uh, five. The money that we spent, we we don't regard it as as a as a great affront to dignity uh, that 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 grandmother should die. 
but we do re regard it as a great affront to dignity uh, that grandmother should not have a very particularly color of coffin or something like this. Yeah. And uh, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I honestly like the funerary business. These are many fine people earning a, a, a nice living from this, uh, but uh, um, like it would that that money would represent a, some significant amount, about six percent of. The cost that would be required to have a public health service in the United States, you know, like you mentioned, uh, other other kind of uh, products have dubious value, the do number yeah. get totaling in the trillions of dollars. We, sometimes when you look at what capitalism is doing, even not from a regulatory uh, standpoint, just from a like, what the hell is all of that stuff? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you see yeah, the yeah. same thing in tech. Uh, the consumer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh. Consume what we're told we need to consume, but yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think that uh, when 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 the the politics and, and all of this comes into it, 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 that can become the focus. But at the same time, when you look at what we can do and what we couldn't do before, it, it's an incredibly exciting time to be alive. And it's 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 difficult to understand what we can do now. To be, I mean, it's very it's impossible to understand the speeds at which things are happening in in the electrical world. It's beyond human comprehension um, and the amount of, you know, when, when, when something can do, a supercomputer can do 14 petaflops or whatever it is per second. I mean, I, I think I read somewhere that's if you counted every second back to the Big Bang, you still wouldn't have as many uh, units as these supercomputers can do in one second. That's completely incomprehensible, but it's real uh, and we're doing it and we have these capacities. Um, and so and a lot of that is a nice cool drink from a fire hose. Like it's not even, we're not even quite sure what to do with it sometimes. Oh no, I have uh, no idea. Uh, no idea. Yeah. But it's uh, amazing that we can do this and it's amazing that we can engineer genes. And even if that's still kind of it's in its infancy, um, you know, there are a tiny number of people that have benefited greatly from that, but that in coming years is going to be such a, a godsend, particularly for monogenetic diseases or, or, or you know, wherever the, the low hanging fruit, if it's it's not very low hanging, but it's lower and other fruit, um, these will be wonderful breakthroughs and wonderful interventions. Um, and again, 50, 60 years ago, you know, 1953, we identify DNA. So uh, you don't have to go back that far to a really, really different world. Like I've often used the example, if you take someone in their 80s now and you revert back to when they were a child, which is a long time, for sure, but I'm halfway there, so it's not an eternity, you know. I can I can see how that time would elapse. Um, but if you take them back to when they were a baby, and you meet another eighty year old, eighty something year old, and you travel back to when they were a baby, absolutely that is a long time. But it's also eighteen fifty. Mm. You know, mm. it's only two lifetimes ago. And um, there's three newspapers in the world. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, no, there's okay. I think uh, anesthetic comes in in 1847, but nobody uses it, obviously, in 1850. So you've no anest uh, anesthetic, you've no, um, you know, antibiotics. So you work with your hands. You get a, a severe cut. You're going to get an infection. You 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 may need to lose your arm. Here's a, here's a sip of whiskey and something to bite into. Um, <laughs> this is it's it's a world. I'm sure for some people they were reading books, but for the vast majority of people, the world is so different in two lifetimes. Mm. You know, that, and, and while you can get it carried away and exaggerated in your mind with techno-optimism or whatever, mm. it, it's also something we can under, um, underestimate sometimes. The, the, mm. the rate of change is astounding and is accelerating. Mm. Um, mm. And so the possible is, you know, running away all the time. Um, it's so one of my biggest pet peeves of people in this community is not talking about implementations, uh, uh, not talking about uh, policy, not talking about uh, uh, near term, <laughs> near term ideas. You know, it, it very quickly becomes, you know, conversations about, oh, someday we'll be able to resurrect Hitler. What should we do? You know, like that's, that's yeah. not an interesting conversation. And that's most so, of uh, I feel like that's kind of most of what's going on. Yeah, uh, that, but that's um, that's intellectual play rather than you know practice yeah. uh, the, the applications yeah. that we have now are astounding and the, the, mm. the technological capacity that we have now is astounding and uh, to me there are many many uses for it but one of them is 
certainly to look at these uh, diseases uh, that we all succumb to, even if we turn a blind eye to them. Um, and and we have the theories, we have some of the science, we have uh, very good roadmaps as to how we get to where we need to get to. Um, but we we need the industry to grow. We need people to advocate for it. I mean, I think media savvy people are probably the best people for this movement to uh, incorporate now. You know, real mm. good media friendly individuals who can get out and um, present this message in a way that people want to hear it. Uh, mm. um, because it's it's feasible and it's highly desirable and it's its arrival is not inevitable. There, there, there's a big gap between, you know, when this will occur and when when it might occur. Uh, if mm. if all seven billion people decided tomorrow, okay, that's it. We're not doing anything else. We're just concentrating on this, and mm. we're going to share algorithms. We're going to share information. We're going to share research, and until we find these uh, the the rock bed of these cures, we're doing nothing else. Then, and it could be quick. That could happen quickly. From a from a small lake, or now grows a mighty oak. Yeah, uh, so that, I mean, that that I reorientation. Think, yeah, I think that advocacy is really, really important. Um, mm. And while it has improved vastly in the ten years I'm familiar with it, it's still a drop in the ocean when you look at. I mean, mm. how many people actually professionally work in this in this field? How many people? Even among scientists, most of them will tell you they're working, like I say, on Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or something, because there's still a little bit of a taboo in it. Um, but mm. in media, I, I don't know. Is there a handful of people? Mm. Yeah. Uh, no, it, I mean, I mean, honestly, like, there are so few uh, people uh, doing a, a show that even is sometimes talking about life extension. Like, but Alex Jones was kind of that person. I mean, there are there are all, but there are so many outlets. But you know, in in the in the really on on the big on the big scale, there's it's it's, it's nothing, and it, it's that yeah, that's that's not good. <laughs> what do you think um, is the this is a sort of the uh, everybody's uh, favorite office pool? Um, where should I move? I want to be a life extensionist. I want to be ahead of the curve. Who's going to get there oh. first? to something approaching a, a life extension for everyone who wants it. Dublin, I I, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Um, I really don't know. Uh, like you, you would like to think that this this will be the level of dependency on where you are would be very low. You would hope, mm. Um, mm. and as you said, the universal the universalization of these things. Um, is incredibly important. Now, there is one good note on that, because again, one of the fears you'll hear from people is, oh, would it be just for rich people? Well, something that, like, blood pressure medication is never expensive, because huge numbers of people buy it, like huge numbers of people. So if you have medicines that address aging, you're looking at such a vast population pool that it is highly unlikely to be expensive for very long. So I think that's a positive message on that. Um, and that should mean that this stuff, it's not going to be invented in a particular country and then kept in that country. Um, so I would like to think that it doesn't really matter. But where people can contribute is a different thing. Um, where they can uh, come together. I, I, I have a feeling there may be some, in the coming decade or so, there may be some maybe university-based communities or cities or something like that that will that will uh, completely concentrate on this because it has moved you know there are a few institutes now there are, uh, and and that's quickly gaining momentum there was no conference well there were conferences but nobody attended them and now all of a sudden with the advent of the dublin conference next year but you know there are there are a couple of conferences the the conference in berlin has um has had two years and has grown massively uh, in that two-year period, and in its third iteration will be three or four times the size of its first iteration. So mm. this is all snowballing, and I do get the feeling that even though the world is very virtually connected, I get the feeling there, there may be um, a move to have an institute somewhere that would allow scientists to work together on this. 
and we'll also have maybe uh, you know an ecosystem of companies who want to work with that with those researchers. I mean, I could be wrong. I look, this happens in in the Bay Area. It happens in in you know places in in around Boston and stuff anyway, and it happens in Moscow and it happens in London. Um, so I might be mistaken to think that it'll be a unique location, but I have a feeling something like that might happen. Like what you're saying that somebody will find a government that is very, very welcoming, very supportive, and will say, look, come over. You can you can try whatever you want here. You can um there's also know, the we're, notions we're of open. leapfrogging in economies of scale. So there's a, a Polynesian yeah. nation that had um uh, a great great abundance of riches in in the nineteen seventies from um from guano. It was a great <laughs> great lot of guano. And um, yeah. you know that money had it been invested properly, uh, would have generated, could have generated, you know, something that would have sustained a a, a, a public health service that would have been a force to be reckoned with. Now the country doesn't uh, have a lot of those things uh, because that money was squandered. And uh, aside from making some kind of morality play, <laughs> uh, the um, the economy, the the uh, an island of that size with twenty thousand people, uh, as that is that is a sovereign nation. And then uh, maybe lacking some of the basic infrastructure, but with the understanding that maybe um, uh, some of that is might not be necessary in this sort of um, uh, more post-industrial health service that we described. Uh, you know that you know that's not a that that might be seven million dollars for the whole operation, not for the advocacy. <laughs> uh, if well, if it's a tiny yeah. tiny city state. Yeah, um, it's interesting. I mean, I. I think this has been threatened for a while and probably in different industries as well that, you know, people would come together physically. And I don't know if it if it ever, you know, do a Manhattan Project type uh, thing. I don't know if it ever really happens. Um, mm -hmm. I've heard people discuss other transhumanist like projects where they want seasteading. So you, you get out there and, and live there for a couple of years and the rules don't apply to you. Again, I think it's easier to talk about than to do. But I have a feeling something might happen like this in this sphere because um, I just think governments are going to start competing. If they have any sense, they will start competing on this because it, this is like having a discussion about compute computation in the 1960s or about automobiles in the 1890s. It, it is, you know, undoubtedly going to be the biggest. I mean, let's say it's not. Let's say it's the second or third biggest industry. Whatever, it's going to be an enormous industry. Um, mm. And so it would seem to me that it would make sense that some governments, they're not going to get every researcher or company in the planet, obviously, but they will create very, very favorable environment um, for people to come in and start generating these enormous sums of money. Like um, I often, when I'm talking to people as well, I, I talk about the fact that I do a little bit of running. I run very badly, but that's, that's kind of the point. Uh, when I look at my... Um, when you run these races, you've got to put your age down. And then they put you into five-year brackets uh, in age categories. And if you look at the results of these races at the end, there's almost nobody in their teens, almost nobody in their 20s, huge numbers in their 30s, even bigger numbers in their 40s, huge numbers in their 50s, big numbers in the 60s, some in the 70s. Um, so almost nobody in that is running to win or to go to the Olympics or that's not why they're running. There's a bit of an adrenaline and it's something to do and stuff, but I think there's more deep rooted reason for that. Um, and I think it's, there's a, this latent uh, sort of desire not to become sick, not to be frail, not to lose what, because I, I I haven't done the statistical analysis of this now, but I'm almost certain 40s or 50s are the two biggest populated decades. Not 20s, definitely. And I don't think 30s either. I think it's more people in their 40s and 50s. So to me, that's yeah. trying to hold on to something. And it, it's an expression. And I feel like if you could turn up at the end of these races with some products that were scientifically, you know, valid and credible, that in any way, would extend the period of time that they could run those races and could remain healthy. Um, it's it's a mind-boggling, bogglingly big uh, market, uh, just extraordinary. And that's what's so exciting. Um, and I don't necessarily want to become, you know, incredibly wealthy from this. I'd like to become financially independent. But 
it's just exciting that it, it it's at a phase now where anybody could be the superstar or any company could be the again like the automobiles in the 1890s there was cars that were half you know engine in the back engine in the front three wheels two wheels four it, it was all up in the air and then eventually you get your ford model t or whatever it is and you get your standard design and 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 i i think the aging industry in 20 30 years time will be a lot more boring there'll be a few giant companies that will have trillions literally between them um and to, if you want to work in that industry you'll have to go in and climb up the ranks and everything but now it's great fun there's investors are meeting scientists at these conferences it's worth going to a conference particularly the dublin one um just to look at the bubbling up of of uh potential you know you you get a scientist that has this product or this molecule that they've discovered that they think might do something and and you have an investor over here who, who doesn't really know much about aging has money and understands the market capacity of, of this and, and is really excited and is looking around for someone on the science side to explain what's going on. And everybody is excited and everybody's enthusiastic. And But it's still a couple of thousand people at most, you know. Um, so I'd encourage anybody to get into this industry in whatever way they can, be they media advocates, be they, um, you know, people in the business side of things obviously the scientists are even more important and worth their weight in gold um for any kid that's in the university and that, you know has the capacity to do this um that's probably the first place for them to go but there's lots of other roles as well um and it's it's such an exciting industry at this time i think it's the best time to get involved because it's not set in stone it's not five six companies dominating the global market as it will be in time i assume um and i think That's governments good. there isn't you know there is the possibility of governments coming in and saying no we are going to take the lead no oh, no we're going to take the lead um, that's a good insight for that's a good insight for our listeners um many of mm -hmm. them are on, on entrepreneurial and um you know uh, there, this is a guy peter teal who's you know, we're talking about monopolism when yeah. he writes books that uh, describing to people um you know i don't agree with much of his politics but well, this book is kind of useful for uh, thinking along these lines of uh, uh, what is this uh, market that doesn't exist that should exist and how do you um and how do you build that out into into a big operation and it's precisely what you're describing here in in the life if, sciences and the if, if there's entrepreneurs watch it i i think you can take as a baseline that you can sell that there's a quarter of a trillion dollars sold on anti-aging creams. That's a baseline that do not work at all. Um, now, of course, there there is a problem with snake oil, and it will. There's no getting away from that. That will continue to be a problem and will grow as a problem as this industry grows. Um, and then there is, you know, really, really credible medical interventions that will come. But the reality is that it's the enthusiasm and the excitement that will make the market anyway. So there, there will be investors that will come in, they'll take a, a hit molecule, they'll, they'll put some money into that. That molecule has 15 years of a journey to travel. It's not, it's not like any other industry, really. Um, it, it, it's not, you don't have sales in year one, two, and three. You don't have any sales. You, you don't have sales until about 12 or 15 years later. But what happens is, as your molecule hits different milestones its value um increases dramatically um because the percentage of its risk of failure which is still very high almost all of these molecules fail but the percentage of its failure risk goes down and so its value goes way up mm. and so if you want to invest in something you invest in these molecules and they go from one step one milestone to another milestone in, in the preclinical and clinical trials trial phase and you make a huge sum of money. This may never become a product. In fact, it probably won't become a product. And the reason that that money is built into the system is the pharmaceutical companies, for them to develop a drug is a billion dollars, but actually it's 2.4 billion. And they factor this into their costs, obviously. So the 2.4 billion, that's including the cost of all the ones that fail at different stage, stages. So to take one drug through is a billion, but including the cost of all the ones you know are not going to work it's 2.4 billion so they have built that into the system so 
it's a in in some ways it's a wonderful industry for for people coming in at the lower levels because you were everybody knows your molecule is actually unlikely to be a drug you know very few get that far but everybody also knows that you have to trial many many things to get a success and so as it's getting closer to the finish line its value is increasing um mm. and and when it makes certain milestones uh, you know human trials obviously it, its value can really explode um so there's an awful lot of money to be made in that there's an awful lot of money to be made in in maybe even in supplements and things that that uh, you know may not have the scientific credibility but there are some elements of supplements um if you look at david sinclair in harvard and uh, you know he's uh, NAD plus precursors and NMN and things like this. I mean, these may well be supplements that will be that will have some benefit uh, in terms of health span. Yeah. Let me ask you something. Is this uh, we've been talking for a while? Uh, I don't know how many of the cryo uh, hardliners will get this far into the talk, so maybe I can get away with it. Um, yeah, I talked sure. to a gentleman. I talked to a gentleman named Rudy Hoffman, uh, who's doing. I believe is doing good work. He has a book. Uh, called the affordable immortal that shows people uh, how to uh, fund a uh, cryo uh, through their life insurance plans in the u.s uh would you buy this book would you would you look would you explore uh, looking into uh, a cryo or do, would you prefer to stick to the sends kind of discussions for yourself well the sins discussions is where i want to spend my life working and and, yeah. and i'm hoping that is a substantially long life but actually, my own personal interest, yes, absolutely, a hundred percent. I, but that's it's it's a different part of my interest completely. But I do, I do think that uh, um, there's a there's a fatalism around this. That um, like, I think I had spoken to you when we communicated initially that I had a book that was, you know, in a different area about consciousness and stuff, and. Um, and one of the upshots of that book, in fact, even though it, it decentralizes humanity and makes us less important and we, you know, goes further down the road of not being the center of the universe and not being the most important creature on the planet and not being in, in any way special or different to the universe we find ourselves in. Um, but one of the, the sort of the benefits of that decentralization is actually that our, um, our ability to, to challenge debt is much higher than we think. Um, and I to me it's it's just a an incredible tragedy that how we let people die at the moment. You you talked about you know funeral services earlier on and and stuff. I it's very very sad and I don't understand why. Um, I, I I guess it's a learned helplessness. People. Maybe. I mean it's a learned helplessness. There's also an aspect of um, you know. A, People in general have a difficulty with delay of gratification concepts. You know, is you know, uh, yeah. I don't, I don't have, I don't have money set away uh, for retirement. Um, but um, I know. So I the know. young people don't, not doing the, the delay of gratification well, and then you have um, some attenuation in age, um, a, 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 a lack of attention as you're getting older, learned helplessness as you're getting older, less mental acuity as you're getting older. Uh, so you kind of have um, the the people who are best uh, suited to be uh, spearheading this uh, uh, sort of concerning themselves uh, with more near term matters, and the people who are effectively more helpless in it um, are the ones who would who would otherwise uh, be maybe spearheading it. I mean, I don't, the one thing I I see from from in terms of motivation is when to me when if I pass away or whatever it, the post that event makes no difference to me at all obviously but you could say that about every moment in time um if you get hit by a bus or if you get whatever happens the moment you pass on is irrelevant but we don't live like that we do live with almost always with self-preservation as one of our core drives and if you're on your deathbed and someone offers you a cure you will take it so if you're on your deathbed and someone offers you a way to detour via dying and reanimation i can't see why you wouldn't at least take the opportunity but even if you're kidding yourself and it doesn't work if you can say to a loved one um there's a there's a possibility that 
you know, as I slip out into unconsciousness here, um, I will be reanimated in the future, the distant future. Now, one of the things that in in my book that you know upwards of seven people have read at this stage, but um, one of the things that I point out in that is that look, when you're asleep, time doesn't elapse so much. When you're in a coma, time absolutely doesn't elapse. There's lots of jokes about people waking up in twenty years and who's the president and all this type of thing. Um, so when you're dead, we can safely assume that time does not elapse at all because there's no brain activity. That's why time isn't elapsing. In those, those other circumstances, there's less brain activity. And in death, there's zero brain activity. So on your clock, you shut your eyes and you open your eyes um, is the potential. Now, my point is for the person who's bereaved, I think that's a wonderful thought. I think leaving video diaries as you live through your own life uh, to, I mean, people already go to gravestones and they talk to the deceased person symbolically. But if you could actually do that with the possibility, again, that they're reanimated at a, at a future point and can watch these video files or whatever it is and catch up on your life and on their grandkids life or whatever the case is. I think therapeutic benefits of that alone make it justifiable. Is mm. there an element of yep. hope in it? Yeah, but religion is a pretty big deal for humanity. And I mean, surely that's more of a leap of faith than, uh, and, and I think, to me personally, I think cryonics should get positive media coverage as well, because at the moment it's extremely expensive. But of course, the, the way to bring down those costs is to have more people take it as an option, um, as, as someone described it, the ambulance to the future, which I think is a lovely description. Um, but it, it's very difficult to, to fight on all fronts. And uh, that's one that seems to be difficult. Um, but I'm like you. I mean, I, I absolutely will. I sign up for crowd. Absolutely. Have I done it? No. You know, yeah. um, and it's, it's no harm in hedging your bets, um, even if you don't. It, you know, the, the vitrification and reanimation uh, technologies are not fully realized. Uh, but uh, uh, this, you know, what do you have yeah. to lose? It. Listen, uh, I, I, one of the the few things that that book does kind of conclude is, realistically, the vitrification process doesn't even need to work that well at all for you to be reanimated as as what I would consider to be you, because I see it, it's a it's a long story that we won't get into, but I see consciousness as illusory anyway. But if if I, I, you I agree were, with that. Given it's the opportunity, yeah. If you were given the the opportunity, that you're in a, in a terrible car accident, and you have two options: either you die, or you awaken physically perfect, but you have retrograde amnesia. So you cannot form any. You can form new memories, but you have zero memories from before the accident. I'm assuming you'll go with the second one. Now, on top mm -hmm. of that, your family, your friends, your loved ones will tell you everything about you, and you will be you physically, biologically. And um, your connect home, it may not have, you know, certain patterns of behavior, but th even that's debatable around whether you can. Yeah, I, think, I think it's a I think it's a um, a kind of uh, a sentiment for our, our physical selves that drives that. I think that Absolutely. because it, 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 yeah. because the memory is is the thing. And um, yeah. um, but, uh, you know, we are we are and and with good reason, the, the, the body is what is what we know. I, I did think the head in a jar would not, without the hormones and the the uh, other sort of uh, drivers uh, would not would not be a fully fledged person in, in maybe in that form. Um, yeah, I think there's yeah there's an argument around the functional representation or whatever in silico or whatever. But but I do think that you know if, if you wake up with retrograde amnesia and you walk out as a patient and you use the bathroom and you you've no idea who you are, you you don't know who you are, but you know you're you, if you know what I mean. When you look in the mirror, you know it's you. Uh, you've no idea who that you is, but it's still you. Um, and I think, logically, any sort of, of um, uh, maintenance of your information at the point of death now is useful and intelligent because it will most likely, at least from, from my thinking and writing, it will allow you to at least have a retrograde amnesia, amnesia version of yourself. Can Not catch working. Up. I worked. I just finished a uh, a first rough cut of a, a mini documentary about resurrectionism, 
and it's using it's a, it's a uh, um, it's a, um, uh, a sort of a digital seance in a word. It's using a deep fake uh, technology um, and virtual reality technology to create um, a um, a an experience a techno spiritualist experience for myself um, uh, with a visitation with my de deceased grandfather. And it was, the reason for doing this was to um, also, uh, aside from maybe give people a little bit of a tearjerker story, uh, to um, uh, include some discussions along these lines that I've had in in the film and promote my candidacy. Um, but um, I just finished it, and and I'm about just about to send it to uh, all the people I also worked on it and see if it and see if it actually is something that they find moving or interesting at all. Yeah. Uh, I look forward yeah. to seeing it at some point. Yeah, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll get it to you. Um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm going to be promoting it quite soon. Well, this has been, this has been a wonderful talk. Um, yeah. I, um, I want to do this again uh, soon. Let's not wait till April. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we could, we could go on and on about this. Okay, listen. Thank you very much, and best yeah. of luck in your candidacy. <laughs>